Amen. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach this morning. Um, I was reading through this passage, and um, there was just one line that stuck out to me. You guys read the you guys read the passage. Um, Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin. It's a mock trial, and they bring in all these witnesses, right? And to bear false testimony against Jesus. And eventually the high priest looks at Jesus and says, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And that was the, that was the phrase that stuck out to me. Jesus remained silent. And so I'm just going to use that a little bit as a springboard to talk about something that is not really connected to this passage at all. Um, It just, it made me, it made me ask the question, why does God stay silent sometimes? Um, You know, like, and the time when we really notice it the most is when we're in distress, when, when things are really painful or things are really confusing or we're in great need and it's like, I need you the most right now, God. And sometimes it just feels like he's totally silent. Um, why? Why does he do that? Um, I've got two answers. Uh, the first answer is really related to what Pastor Steve was just talking about. He stays silent with us because he loves us. Uh, Which I know that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Um, You've got to get to know him better before that answer will make sense. He stays silent because he loves us, and he wants that love to be in us as a possession something that is ruling inside of us. Um, So that's one reason. The other reason is because he's looking for something from us. He's looking for faith. Um, He's looking for faith. And there's a lot of misperceptions about faith. Sometimes you hear people talk about faith, and it's like faith is just believing in doctrinal facts. So it, basically, there are a list of facts that we're all supposed to believe. Jesus is the Son of God. The, the Godhead is in three parts. Um, Jesus died as, uh, or Jesus was born as a virgin. Uh, Jesus was born as a virgin. Jesus was born as a virgin. See, I don't even know the facts. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He died and was, and was resurrected after the third day, right? These are the facts that we're supposed to believe. And as long as we say, yes, I believe that, it's like, oh, this person has faith. Um, sometimes people talk about it like it's a feeling. And if I feel confident about God, or if I feel confident about my walk with God, or whatever, then, then, I'm, then I have faith. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm, I got strong faith, brother, you know? But if then I, if I'm not feeling real great, then it's like, wow, I'm just really struggling with my faith. Some people talk about faith like it's a, uh, like a spiritual attitude that I'm supposed to maintain in order to get God to do stuff for me. So I need a job, or I need reconciliation with my kids, I need help in my marriage, or whatever, and so I'm just supposed to have this mental attitude, and somehow that enables God to work in my life. And if I don't have that attitude, then God can't. It's like a manipulation. It's like I stick in a coin into a vending machine, and because I put in the right amount, you know, and then hit the button, out comes out what I want. None of those things are faith. Um, And I'm not saying, okay, by faith, we do believe the facts. 
Some of them are hard to believe. (laughs) But by faith, we do believe them. And faith does produce feelings of confidence. And through faith, God does work in our lives. But that, none of those are the essence of faith. Um, and I, I don't know if you've ever heard Pastor Steve say, but the Bible doesn't, really, it doesn't give us a definition of faith. So some people will turn to Hebrews 11, and it's like, okay, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of unseen things. There you go. That's the definition. But that's not really, that's not a definition of faith. That is explaining an aspect of faith. It's one aspect of faith. Just like if somebody from China came over here and they said, what does it mean to be an American? You're just going to give them one sentence? You got it. Now you understand what it's like to be an American. You know, you have, there's, we have hundreds of years of history. And we have all of these different, really important events that have taken place that make us what we are today. So to say that faith is, well, it's just this, that's not true. God, God gave us this to explain what faith is. So you've got all of these stories of men and women who heard God tell them to do things that sound crazy. They're risky. They have to leave their families. I mean, Abraham is supposed to sacrifice his son. Moses is supposed to go with his staff and just command the the greatest uh, ruler on earth to let the people go. I mean, these are the stories that God has given us to explain what faith is. And then he gives us psalms that, that talk about what faith says. You know, what does faith say when you're discouraged? What does faith say when it seems like things aren't going the way that they're supposed to go? What, what does faith say when you're confused and perplexed and when you're under your, the burden of your sins, how does faith talk? And God gives us all these commandments. What does faith do in certain situations, right? What does faith do when you've got sin struggles? What does faith do when you've got relationship problems? What does faith do when um, people are persecuting you? This whole book is an explanation of what it means to live by faith. Now, I wish, man, I wish faith was easy, but it's not. Um, because you've got, you have an enemy, and that enemy, the Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he hates God, and he is constantly working to try to malign the character of God in this world to accuse God and slander God and make, make us suspicious of God. What he, I mean, what he's really trying to do is he's trying to sow thoughts into your life about the character of God, to make you feel about God the way he feels about God. To make you think about God the way he does. And to make you react to God the way he reacts to God. He is suspicious. He's cynical. He's unbelieving. He's a mocker. He's a rebel. He's a hater. And he wants to make us like that. Toward God. And you know the way he does it. The way he does it is through the circumstances of your life. Okay, you live in a world <laughs> where it's impossible to escape pain and suffering. It's, it, you want a pain-free life? Who wants a pain-free life? Anybody? It's, it's not going to happen. Okay? God tells us it's through many trials and many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. There's no pain-free way. 
And so, have you ever been abused by someone? Have you been betrayed by someone? Have you been let down or disappointed? Has, have things that you thought would bring you joy and satisfaction, have they just like evaporated from right before you? Has anybody had things like this happen? Anybody? Am I the only one? Okay. And it's right there in the pain of those things where Satan is going to lie to you about God. He's just going to whisper things in your ears about the character of God. And it's not going to, you're not going to, it's not like you look over, whoa, there's Satan. It's just, it's a whisper. What if God doesn't care about me? What if he, what, I mean, what if he doesn't love me? Why, why, did, why did he allow that? Is he cruel? Is he, I mean, he says he's faithful, but like, why? Why then? If God is faithful, why that? Why blank? Fill in the blank. Why? It, and th- it's those things. God, or Satan is slandering God to you. And... I mean, I hate to even bring them up because they're horrible. I mean, they're just, they're, they're horrible lies against the character of God. But this is what leads people away from God in their hearts. It's things like this. And I'm not, no, no one's talking about leaving church. There's, there are, I mean, there's just, there are people in the, I don't, whatever, I don't know percentages, but trust me, there are people in the pews who are, they're going to church on Sunday, they're listening to Christian music, they're part of the subculture, but they believe lies about God. They don't believe that God is who he says he is because you know why? He let them down. And so their hearts are shut off from God. We talked about that love, right? That God wants to pour his love into our hearts. Well, if we believe lies about him, we are not going to let him in. You let me down. You failed me. You said you loved me. You said you'd provide for me. Whatever whatever these things are, we shut ourselves off from God. And you know what silence is? (laughs) Silence is a test of our faith. It's a test to find out. I know, that poor Boaz, he doesn't want to go through it. Who does? It's a test of our faith. You know, (laughs) I don't know if you're aware of this, but like if God has priorities for you in your life, right up at the top is that you would be a man of faith. That That is his priority in your life. You're in a relationship with him, right? And that's what he's after. Now, I I get it. Like this is not what we're after sometimes. In our relationship with God... We're like, this is great. I'm in a relationship with you. And so here's your job description, God. Provide for me, protect me, and make me happy. That's all you have to do. Yeah, okay. By the way, you're not God, you're man. So we need to get in our rightful place. And God is going to speak to us. Here's my description for you. I'm going to make you a man of faith. I'm going to make you a man of faith. And so what he is going to do in your life is he is going to test your faith. Um, I was thinking about, I've, I hate tests. <laughs> uh, I don't like test faith. I don't like tests of character. I, I just don't, I don't like it. It's not fun. Uh, most of the time I feel like it's, 
a string of failures until I learn the lesson. And then it's like, okay, I think I finally passed. And God is not trying to fail us. He's trying to prepare us to pass. You know, I mean, you think about like a group of engineers and they get together and they're making an engine and they put that thing through stress tests because they want to figure out where is it going to fail so that they can fix it, so they can make it better, so that it won't fail. That's what God does. He puts us through tests to find out where are their weaknesses, where are their vulnerabilities, under what conditions will this guy fold? You know, under what conditions will he not believe in me? Under what conditions will he not trust me? And then he allows us to go through situations to, so that we can see where we're weak. And then he gives us the opportunity to repent and change so that the next time we pass. Amen. He's not trying to fail us. He's trying to, yeah, he's trying to teach us how to live a life of faith. I mean, there's some people that, you, I mean, you can reject this. You can reject this plan. Like, nope, I'm not in it for that. I'm just in it for God to make me happy. And you will never become a man of faith. You can't. You, and then, you, you know, then you stand before the judgment and you don't, you don't pass. But if you let him put your faith to the test, he's going to make you stand. All right, so what happens in us when God is silent? What comes out of us? What's the quality of our faith? And how do we respond? I want to talk about just three things, three ways to respond when God is silent. Number one, if God is silent, seek him more earnestly. If he is silent, seek him more earnestly. The enemy is trying to get you to distrust God. He's trying, you know, he's trying to get you to believe that it's not worth it. It's not worth it to seek God and try to get you to just stop. You know, stop praying. None of this happens on a conscious level. It happens very subconsciously. But just look at your life. Where are you at? He's trying to get you to stop praying. He's trying to get you to stop reading your Bible. He's trying to get you to stop fellowshipping with godly believers. He's trying to get you to stop really pressing into God. That's what he's trying to do. Or he's trying to get you to just do those things with no hope, no faith, no expectation. So it's like you just go through the motions. You go to church, but you're not, you're not hungry. You're not expectant. You're not there to seek God. It's just a ritual. You just go and you listen to a sermon and then you leave and nothing changes, right? That's what he, he's okay with that. There's no problems there. No problems. And what keeps us from really earnestly seeking the Lord is when we are allowing these lies to take root in our hearts. Like, if you believe that God has abandoned you, you're not going to earnestly seek Him, are you? If you believe that God has forgotten about you, or he's too busy, or he's, un, or he's like distracted, or he just doesn't really care. Or if you believe that, you know, nothing good is going to come out of it anyway. So it's just an exercise in futility. So why do it? These are things, has anyone ever, am I just, am I the only one who has ever thought these things, struggled? Am I the only one? Okay. Am I the only one who has been tempted to just coast, to just go into drift mode because I feel these things or think these things. Okay, I, that's good. I'm glad because I was like, oh, maybe I'm just preaching to myself. Y 
You, did you just hear other people respond yes to those or no to the, yeah, right? You're, you're not the only person. You're not the only people who have thought this way. This is a common temptation. It's common to man. For instance, David. David felt abandoned by God. Psalm 22, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. And by night, but I find no rest. This was David. (laughs) Felt abandoned by God. The exiles in Babylon, they felt like God had forgotten them. That's why he prophesied through Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob... And why do you speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? They felt that way too. Asaph, he felt like, you know what? It's been pointless to try to live for God. You know, he looked around, this was obviously a very low point in his life, But he looked around and he saw people who weren't even pretending to seek God. They weren't even even trying to follow God. And he's like, man, they they got it made. They've got more than enough food. They're rich. They're prosperous. They are living the good life. And what am I getting from trying to serve God? I'm sick. I'm going through trials and tribulations. It's pointless. This is basically what he said. It's pointless. Now, he thoroughly repented of that attitude, but he felt that way. You're not the first, you're not the first one to have ever felt these feelings and to have been tempted to just go into coast mode, drifting mode. Like, I'm not leaving the church. I'm not outright. I'm, I'm not an atheist, but I'm not pressing in. I'm not seeking, I'm not expecting God to come and just move in my life. I'm just going through the motions. You're not the first person to feel that way, but but please understand, that is displeasing to God. It's very displeasing to Him for you to respond that way. What He's looking for is He's looking for a response of faith. He's looking for something to well up within you that says, I know that it seems like God has been unfaithful. I know it seems like he hasn't been paying attention to me. I know it seems like maybe he's unjust and I don't understand this, but the Bible says no one who puts their hope in him will ever be put to shame. The Bible says Everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. That's what God is looking for. He's waiting to see, will you respond like that? I, yeah, I know, like I said, I, I know that many times I, I did not respond the right way. But... That's why I'm telling you my mistakes. <laughs> so you can do different. You can do better. Point number two. If God is silent, examine your life. <clears throat> Sometimes God is silent because we've been hurting him. We've been grieving him. You know, I'm not married, but I've heard about the silent treatment. Um, I don't know if it goes both. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how it works exactly. (laughs) I think it goes something like this. You hurt me, and so I'm not talking to you. Um, Now, God's not like us. He doesn't, he's, he's not like us. He doesn't go silent on us in order to pay us back, but he does go silent on us to try to get through to us. To try to get us to ask, what's going on? 
Why isn't God answering my prayers? Why isn't he listening to me? Why don't I feel his presence? Why is he withdrawn from my life? He goes silent on us to get us to reflect on our lives and ask, is there something I'm doing that is grieving to God? Am I grieving his spirit? Um, So if God seems silent, I would just encourage you to look at your life. Now, obviously, there are some really blatant sins, right, that we all know about. Sexual immorality, theft, lying, hypocrisy, violence. You know, there's like these really big sins that we would, the big bad ones. Um, But I want to talk about two that I think are, we don't, We don't often think about his sins, um, but they're very grieving to God. One is ingratitude. And I I don't know why it is that this one really stuck out to me as I was preparing, but I've been very guilty of this sin. And God, let me tell you a story (laughs) Um, so that you know that you're not alone. I was going through a really, I mean, the darkest time I've ever gone through in my life. This was a few years after the program. And um, I was doing everything I knew to do. I mean, I was seeking God like... I was utterly desperate. And um, <laughs> I was reading the Bible, I was praying, I was, doing all this, I was doing all this stuff, right? And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but here's what I'm getting at. I went with a friend to a lady's house that I didn't know. She didn't know me. But she's a very, very godly woman who really hears from the Lord. And we're we're just over there. We're visiting. And then all of a sudden, there's kind of a lull in the conversation. And all of a sudden, she just yells, God will not do a single thing for you until you are grateful. (laughs) I was... I was... I was like, God is seeing my life. That's, I knew it. He is speaking at my life. God will not do a single thing for you until you learn to be grateful. I was horribly ungrateful. All I could see in that time was all that I didn't have and everything that was going wrong. That's all I could see. And it was deeply grieving to God that I couldn't thank him. Um, It's very different now, but I was just, you know, I was just thinking like about everything that God has given to us. If you really have, how many of you have had to do a gratitude list? (laughs) Okay, wow. (laughs) Okay. Sounds like maybe this is something we need to talk about. After all that God has done for us, how could we be ungrateful? How is it possible that we could be ungrateful? He gave us life. And then he put us in a world. I mean, let me just go through some things that he gave us. He gave us a world. Created it from his own power and from his own mind. He created this world with millions of species, birds and animals and cattle, with mountains and rivers and deserts and plains. He stocked it full of of trees that give their bear fruit and all of these plants and vegetables, and there's air and there's sunsets. And then he gave it to us. This is yours. Take it. This is my gift to you. This world is my gift to you. And he gave us hands. Hands so we can touch things. and gra- I mean, you're never grateful probably about your hands until one gets chopped off or something like that. You know what I mean? But he gave us hands. He gave us eyes. Think about all that you can see. 
You can see colors and you can see people. He gave us ears. We can listen to music. We can listen to people talk. We can hear babies cry. We can hear, I mean, it's like unbelievable, the gift of, of hearing, the gift of taste, the gift of our emotions, the gift of our mental abilities. And we can create and we can, uh, we can, People can draw. People can make music. It's endless the things that God has given to us. And he's given us families. He's given us homes. He's given us jobs. He's given us clothing. He's given us food. He's given us friends. And if none, if none of those are enough, he gave us Jesus. The misery that you're in, the sin that you're in, He watched you in your sin and in your blindness and in your confusion. And he said, I know what will help them. I'll give them my son. He'll be a propitiation for their sins. He'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll be a counselor. He'll be a guide. There is zero excuse for us to be ungrateful. And it hurts him. It hurts him when we're ungrateful, you know? And I'm, again, I'm saying this to myself. I did the exact same thing. But it's wrong. It's a crime. It's like crazy. It, you know what it's like? It's like if you've got a friend and every day he's just giving you gifts, constantly giving you gifts. But you know, there's like three or four gifts that you really, really want and he doesn't give them to you. Or there's a couple things that you don't want, and he does give them to you. And with the thousands of good things that he's given, all you can see is what he's withholding and these other things that he gave you that hurt. You know, man, what kind of friend are you? That, that's what we're like. It's, and you know what's worse, to be honest? Ingratitude destroys our lives. Ingratitude it, I, I, don't, I don't even think I can articulate it, but I, it, it destroys your life. It, it twists your perspective. It blinds you to everything that's good in the world. It hardens you against the word of God. It, it pollutes your perspectives about God. You, you cannot see him when you're ungrateful. And I'm not saying any of that to shame anybody. Just, would you please repent? Please I'm appealing to you as a brother. Would you please repent? If, if your counselor gave you a gratitude journal and wants you to write down five, would you please write down 50? <laughs> you know, like fill that thing. Figure it out. If you can't feel grateful, who cares? Fill that thing. Every time you're ungrateful, fill it with the blessings that God has put around you. Another thing that's, that really grieves God is unforgiveness. It just it hurts him terribly. It, when God looked at us and he saw what we were doing to him, when he felt what we were doing to him, have any of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, just raise a little hand in your heart. <laughs> you know. God will see that heart hand. Um, if you're struggling to forgive somebody, I don't know what to say except that when God felt what you did to him, his response was, I'm going to let my son be pierced so that he can go free. That is how he felt about you personally. You hurt me. This is, this is God speaking. You hurt me, and so I'm going to give you the most precious thing so that you can be forgiven. That is God's response. And so for us to look at someone else and say, they don't deserve to be forgiven. I want them to pay. It hurts God. I mean, how could we? These sins, you know, and not that he goes and sulks in a corner, but it's not surprising that he stays silent when we pray to him then. There's covetousness, there's blaming God, there's grumbling and complaining. You know, and I get it. These things come to the surface. 
But what I'm telling you is, please repent. God is purifying your faith. These things that come up in your life, ingratitude, unforgiveness, just this, I want more out of life. I'm not satisfied. These things, they're sins. And God is trying to bring them up so you can get them out of your life. You know, like a refiner. He puts the gold in the fire and up comes the blackness to purify it away. All right. So if you're if God is silent, just would encourage you, ask God, search me, search me, Lord. What what's in there? What's in there that displeases you? All right, third point. If God is silent. Take seriously what he's already said. If God is silent, take seriously what he's already said. I really firmly believe that God still speaks today. Um, I believe that he, like in our lives, we need right now guidance. (laughs) We need a word from heaven at times. You know, we need something that tells us what to do or where to go or how to handle this decision. We need those things. But even if if God never did that again, He's already spoken. And sometimes I think what we do is we, um, we... We like... God, why aren't you answering me? Why aren't you speaking to me? Why aren't you... And <laughs> but you're not... Are you listening? Are you listening? How many of us did this before? God, speak to me. And this thing is like under three feet of dust. That's a lot of dust. That's not good. That's, that's bad. It's very bad. You are an amazing slob. <laughs> Jordan, Jordan's clearing his throat because he's like, you're one to talk. <clears throat> this, this book is not just like a historical record of things that God said thousands of years ago and things that he did thousands of years ago to people that are nothing like me. And it's just this ancient, unintelligible thing. And uh, it's living. It is alive. And it is, man, this book is unlike any other book. It is, it's light. And it it has the power to break into our darkness and dispel it. It's hope. It has the power to go into us. How many of you have ever felt hopeless or despairing or depressed? This is hope. We should lift, you know, I, you like, if you go to the liturgical churches, they walk down the aisle at the beginning of every service. Like, look at this book. Revere it. It wouldn't be a bad thing if we did that. It's wisdom. You know, it cuts through our confusion and our deceptions. It's bread for us when we're starving, when our souls are just shriveled up and we're just like, I can barely make it through life. It's bread for us. It's, it's you know, it, it heals our wounds. It, it's everything. It's, okay, here's what John Newton wrote about it. This is the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He said, precious Bible, what a treasure does the word of God afford. All I want for life or pleasure, food and medicine, shield and sword. Let the world account me poor. Having this, I ask no more. Is that your testimony about the word of God? 
Do you have that testimony yet? You will if you'd read it. You will if you'll read it. And I'm not talking about just like reading it, you know, like <clears throat> what do we do? We do like a verse a day. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What does a man, what, how does a man drink when he's been wandering in the desert for three days and then he finds an oasis? How does he drink? Read it like that. Read it like that. How does a starving man eat a meal? Read it like that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about desperate hungry, craving, searching, never satisfied until you get what your soul needs. That's what we need. That's, that's how you draw out of God's word the supply for your life. And it's not like, it's, <laughs> it's not like wow, this guy's so spiritual. It, you know, if you like take a homeless guy out for, and he's just hammering cheeseburgers and you're like, wow, that guy, he's a, he's a professional eater. He's just hungry. <laughs> you don't have to be anything special to get out of the Bible treasures. You don't have to be a scholar or a genius. Just be hungry. That's all you got to be. God, you know, let me tell you another testimony. Okay, so this was probably like, uh, seven years after the program, I was telling somebody, I was telling Andrew the other day, I feel like it took about eight years before I was stable um, after coming out of the program. It just took a long time. I was just like, I was a basket case. I was just mentally just a mess. Um, and Faith was just an intense struggle for me. I, like, <clears throat> I don't know how to say it. Uh, what was real to me was not the Word of God. What was real to me was my opinions and my perspectives and my feelings and my difficulties and my circumstances. That's what was real to me. Anybody relate to that? Like, the Word of God is just kind of quiet, but me, you know, that's what I was like. And so I just, I was, I was just desperate. I was like, man, I, I don't even know how to live by faith. I got to, what, how do you do this? So I, the Lord led me to Hebrews and I studied that book desperately for probably four to six months. And I, I do not understand how it happened. I don't, I, it doesn't make, it's not logical. I can't give you steps. All I know is that when I was done with that book, I was a different person. Not without struggles, not without temptations, not with, you know, but like I used, I was plagued with anxiety. I was full of fear. I looked out into the future and I just thought, how am I ever going to make it? Like this, these are the things that I struggled with, just unstable. And at the end of that study, and I can't even, again, I can't even tell you exactly what changed, but I was like, I don't have to be afraid because Jesus is alive. I don't have to be anxious. He's in control. How do I know I'm going to make it? Because I've got a high priest. That's how I know. Things that were just distant, vague Facts became living realities in my life through the Word of God. Through no merit of my own. Just Him being ready, Him being willing to speak in His Word. You know, He's been trying. Guys, He's been trying. He's been trying for years to give you wisdom. He's been trying to give you comfort. He's been trying to give you peace. He's been trying to give you understanding. But were you listening Yeah, so it's no wonder, right? It's no wonder that our lives have been so shaky. And if we don't even really care, 
that much about hearing what he's already said. Why would he come into our lives in some dramatic fashion? So, let me read just a couple quotes to change, uh, to to finish. The most foolish person in the world is the one who has the opportunity to read, absorb, digest, live in, be immersed in the Bible, but doesn't do it because of preoccupation with other things of this world. That's on the negative side. On the positive side, George Mueller said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place that the Bible holds in our life and thoughts. You, you can change, guys. You can change. You can change. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of faith you've had in the past. It doesn't matter, like, all the things that you see in your life, all the sins and the faults and the failings, all the, the, the wreckage. God brought you here to change your life, to make you a man of faith. And, right, and, you know, he might be testing you. He might be testing you. You feel like he's silent. You feel like he's withdrawn. You feel like he's just way distant. It, it's just to, to find out how desperate will you be. How hungry will you be? Will you earnestly seek him? Because if you do, you're going to find him. Will you examine your life? Will you allow him to search you and try you and bring things up to the surface so that you can repent? If you do, your life is going to change. That's the way everlasting. That's what David said. Search me, try me, know my thoughts, test my anxiety, see if there's a wicked way in me, lead me in the everlasting way. And if you will take seriously what he has said, You are going to be a different man. You're going to be a different man. That's why God brought you here to pure life. I just want to pray real quick and say thank you to Jesus. Lord, I I do want to say thank you. I am amazed at your long-suffering, your loving kindness. Just how unbelievably gracious you have been to us, Lord. And I do pray for these guys, if they feel like they're very distant from you, if they feel like you're being silent, Lord, I pray that they would just be like, yeah, to just do what your word says, Lord, to seek you with all of their heart, to not grow weary in doing well, to put all of their hope in you, Jesus, to search and search and seek until they find what they need, Lord. I thank you that it's available to everybody. Nobody's disqualified. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you that the free gift is available to anybody who would come and take it. In your name, amen.